Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter, Phil Deerking, and Anna Mateo. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Mario Ritter. Indonesian President Joko Widodo is facing a social media campaign as he prepares to seek re-election next year. The campaign has criticized him for failing to show enough sympathy to Islamic interests and the rising prices of household goods. The movement is calling itself Hashtag 2019 Ganti Presiden, which means change the president in 2019 in the Indonesian language. Police officials have rejected several requests by the group to organize protests. In the past, its members have clashed with supporters of the president, who is known as Jokowi. The police decision has led the movement's organizers to accuse Jokowi of using authoritarian methods like those of former President Suharto. Mardani Ali Sera of the Prosperous Justice Party launched the social media campaign. He told VOA that he got the idea while appearing on a television program in which all the panelists appeared to praise the President. Mardani said he decided that was not good for democracy and that he wanted to change the government. Indonesia is the world's third largest democracy. However, the country has struggled to balance the ideas of freedom of speech with keeping the peace between ethnic and religious groups. Many comments linked to the hashtag 2019 Ganti President movement seem aimed at inciting disputes. For example, some accuse Jokowi of secretly being a Christian, not a Muslim. They also accuse him of supporting the Chinese Communist Party. The president denies these things. Earlier this month, he told the Indonesian publication Tempo, This country is a democracy. Yes, you are free to gather, to argue. But remember there are limits. There are rules. Neno Warisman is an activist who opposes the president. Neno said she went to the Sumatran city of Pekanbaru in August to attend a hashtag 2019 Ganti President event. But she said she was met by supporters of the president who threw things at her car. Police sent her back to Jakarta on an airplane, she said. The Deputy Speaker of Indonesia's House of Representatives said the incident showed an authoritarian mentality in Jokowi. In 2014, the year he was elected president, Joko Widodo appeared on the cover of Time magazine, in which he was called the new face of Indonesian democracy. He was unlike Indonesian leaders who came before him. 
He was not from a political family or a general. Instead, he had served as a mayor in Solo, a city on the island of Java. But observers say democracy has suffered during his years as president. They point to the jailing of Jakarta governor Basuki Ahok Jahaja Purnam in May of 2017 on blasphemy charges. The government also has been criticized for outlawing the Islamic group Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia, which seeks to establish an Islamic caliphate in the country. Until 2017, only one organization, the Indonesian Communist Party, was banned by the government. Critics of Jokowi say this shows that he is acting like a dictator. Tom Papinski is an associate professor at Cornell University in the United States. He said that the Indonesian political system still has laws that permit the regulation of political speech should the president choose to do so. Officials say that activists in the campaign have been denied requests to demonstrate for several reasons. The activists reportedly spread hate speech, misinformation, and are a threat to public order. But Rahayu Saraswati of Garindra compares the hashtag 2019 Gandhi President group to Americans who oppose U.S. President Donald Trump. He said in Indonesia, the campaign is a rally call to all those who feel the same. I'm Mario Ritter. Researchers are using DNA evidence to fight the illegal trade in ivory. They have shown how genetic testing is able to link seizures of valuable elephant tusks to ivory traffickers. In a report, the researchers say targeting ivory smugglers could have a major effect on elephant poaching. Wildlife experts note that illegal hunting threatens the very existence of the animals. The findings mean some ivory smuggling suspects already facing charges from earlier arrests could face additional charges or larger fines if found guilty. Ivory trafficking is a huge business with ties to other illegal activities, including drug trafficking. Poachers kill an estimated 40,000 elephants each year. Samuel Wasser is a biologist with the University of Washington. He and other researchers have studied tusks seized in police raids to identify where poached elephants came from. They had earlier identified places in Tanzania and Mozambique from which almost all the ivory seized between 2006 and 2014 came. Wasser and the team noticed that when ivory shipments were seized, they often only contained one of an elephant's two tusks. 
They examined genetic records from major raids on smugglers between 2006 and 2015. The records had information about DNA, short for deoxyribonucleic acid. The chemical is found in nearly all creatures and carries genetic information. The researchers reported finding 26 examples where a tusk from one seizure was genetically similar to one from a separate shipment. In each case, the two shipments passed through the same port within a few months of each other. Wasser said that suggests the same major trafficking organization was responsible for shipping both. The study was published in the journal Science Advances. It follows the ivory back to three major trafficking groups. They are based in Lome, Togo, Mombasa, Kenya, and Entebbe, Uganda. When traffickers are caught, they usually only face charges for one shipment. But the methods Wasser's group developed can link individual smugglers to more than one shipment and to each other. For example, an important suspect in the Uganda group currently is awaiting trial for one seizure. The new study links him to two others. One of those includes tusks from a 2012 incident where poachers in a Ugandan helicopter shot 22 elephants across the border in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. You can imagine, if this evidence is used, how much stronger a case we can build against him, Wasser said. The new study also finds links between the criminal organizations in Togo and Kenya. East African and West African tusks were found in a shipment seized in Malaysia. Ivory from this shipment is connected to tusks from separate seizures linked to Lome and Mombasa. East African drug smuggling suspects facing charges in the United States have also been linked to the Kenyan Ivory Trafficking Group. Frank Pope heads the nonprofit group Save the Elephants. He believes that the stories coming from the new study are very important. Wasser's work is helping us to close in on other networks by telling the story of the connections between the different shipments, Pope said. Wasser's methods have already helped investigators interfere with trafficking operations, notes John Brown, a special agent with the Department of Homeland Security Investigations. But Brown notes that few countries are obeying orders to send ivory collected in raids for genetic testing. This makes it harder for law enforcement to get to the beginning of the problem, he added. A seizure of three tons of ivory looks very good on the front page of the local newspaper, Brown said, but if we don't attack the transnational criminal organizations behind it, then the problem will continue. I'm Phil Deerking. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. Some diseases receive a lot of attention in the media. Viruses like Ebola virus disease, HIV, and influenza are just a few examples. However, none of them is the number one infectious disease killer around the world. Scientists say that tuberculosis, or TB, is the deadliest infectious disease. The World Health Organization reports that in 2017, 
10 million people were sickened with TB, and 1.6 million people died from the disease. The United Nations General Assembly hopes to bring attention to the problem by holding its first-ever high-level meeting on tuberculosis. The meeting will take place on Wednesday, September 26th, at the UN's headquarters in New York City. One goal of the talks is to expand efforts to end the disease and help those affected. One such person living with TB is 54-year-old Stella Malhas of South Africa. Life has not been easy for her. She takes nine pills a day for her condition, far less than the 27 she used to take each day. She is unemployed, suffers from multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, and has HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. She says people she knows even close family members, keep a distance from her. Tuberculosis may not get the kind of attention that other diseases do. However, health experts warn that we should not ignore TB. Hank Tomlinson heads the Division of Global HIV and TB at America's Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He says that TB is a major health threat. It's the number one infectious disease killer. It kills more people now annually than HIV. There are about 1.7 million deaths each year from tuberculosis, and it's a threat everywhere because of the way it's spread and the ease with which it is spread. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease that spreads through the air. The people most affected are those who live and work closely with other people in small spaces and those with weak natural defenses for fighting disease. Health experts at the CDC say that about 2 billion people are infected with tuberculosis worldwide. Rebecca Martin is director of the CDC's Center for Global Health. She says that preventative treatment is most important, especially for those with the latent or inactive form of TB. Getting them on treatment, which is less expensive, a shorter course, and the adherence is much higher, we can stop going on to active TB, which leads to spread of more TB. The CDC website explains the difference between latent and active forms of the disease. It says persons with latent TB infection do not feel sick and do not have any symptoms. They are infected with M. tuberculosis but do not have TB disease. Persons with latent TB infection are not infectious and cannot spread TB infection to others. To treat the disease, doctors can advise patients to take medicines. But if patients do not complete their treatment, drug resistance can develop. As Hank Tomlinson notes, this makes treating TB even more difficult. These are, are, are variants of tuberculosis that are severe. They don't work with the common four-drug treatment. They're resistant to one or more of those drugs, and they require a different, um, more challenging course of treatment for a patient. Scientists and health officials hope that the high-level UN meeting will strengthen the fight against TB and possibly save millions of lives. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. 
James Madison was elected in 1808. He was a capable president who served two terms. But most Americans do not remember Madison for his presidency. They remember him for work he did earlier. After the Revolutionary War, in which the American colonists separated from Britain, Madison proposed that the new United States form a stronger national government. Madison's vision for a three-part government with an executive, a legislature, and an independent Supreme Court became the basis for the Constitution we still use today. Madison went on to persuade voters to accept the proposed Constitution. He explained how a system of checks and balances would prevent any one part of government from becoming too powerful. And when voters demanded more protection for individual liberties, Madison wrote the amendments that became the Bill of Rights. These actions earned Madison the name Father of the Constitution. Madison did not have the appearance of most politicians. He was a short man with a soft voice who had been sick often as a child. He grew up in a wealthy family in Virginia. He liked to read books and to study. He went to college at the school that later became Princeton University in New Jersey. When the Revolutionary War started, Madison's intelligence and knowledge, as well as family money, helped him participate in debates about independence. Madison also held positions in the new American government he helped create, including as Secretary of State under President Thomas Jefferson. Madison did not have much of a personal life. Many people were surprised when he married a young widow named Dolly Payne Todd. She was 26. He was 43. The couple did not have children but they raised Mrs. Madison's surviving son together. Stories suggest the two were very happy, although they had different personalities. Dolly Madison was energetic, warm, and social. She loved to throw parties, and her guests loved to attend them. Historian Catherine Algor notes, Dolly Madison often dressed dramatically including wearing turbans covered with peacock feathers. Her weekly gatherings at the president's house were so crowded that they became known as squeezes. As First Lady, Dolly Madison did not follow her husband's idea of a strict separation of powers. She invited officials from all parts of the government to her parties, as well as people from opposing political groups. Al Gore says, Dolly Madison succeeded in making the president's house a symbol of unity and glamour. She remains one of the best known and most loved first ladies in U.S. history. But his wife's popularity could not prevent Madison from facing a difficult presidency. During his first term, the U.S. faced increasingly tense relations with Britain. Madison accused the British of interfering with international trade and seizing American sailors. At the same time, European-American settlers blamed the British for helping native tribes fight against them. But the settlers had violated treaties between the U.S. government and the Native Americans. In 1811, Native warriors attacked U.S. soldiers at the Battle of Tippecanoe in today's state of Indiana. A U.S. general named William Henry Harrison led his troops to fight back. The result was not clear, but Harrison declared victory. The following year, 
Madison proposed war against Britain. Congress approved. The War of 1812 began. For most of the war, American forces failed. But in 1813, they had two notable victories in Canada. They captured and burned the city of York in Toronto. And General Harrison had another major fight with native warriors at the Battle of the Thames. The Native Americans were defeated. The leader of the tribal alliance, Tecumseh, died from the wounds he received there. That loss ended, for the most part, the efforts of Eastern Native American tribes to push back white settlers. In 1814, the war turned again. British soldiers took the U.S. capital of Washington, D.C. Madison had already left the president's house to meet with generals in the field. Dolly Madison remained. But when she learned the British were approaching quickly, she acted. She famously ordered her servants, as well as a 15-year-old house slave named Paul Jennings, to take down a painting of George Washington. The servants, slaves, first lady, and painting all escaped to safety. Commanders of the British force took a group of men to the Capitol building and set it on fire. Then they went to the president's house. They found the table set for dinner. The British commanders stopped to toast the president before they burned his home. By the time Washington, D.C. burned, American and British officials were already in peace talks. But in the U.S., one more major battle was being fought. A militia general named Andrew Jackson led a ragtag army against a British attack in New Orleans, Louisiana. The Americans' rain of bullets and shells was so deadly that only one British soldier reached the top of the American defenses. When the British finally withdrew, they left behind more than 2,000 dead and wounded. 500 other British soldiers had been captured. 13 Americans were killed. The Battle of New Orleans was considered a great victory for the U.S. However, it was not necessary. The war had ended by treaty two weeks earlier. The War of 1812 almost bankrupted the U.S. government and cost the lives of tens of thousands of soldiers. It was devastating for many Native Americans. It did provide a chance for several thousand slaves to escape to freedom by serving in the British military. But it did nothing to improve the lives of most of one million enslaved people in the U.S. at the time. Despite all this, the war united most of the country. Albert Gallatin, Madison's Treasury Secretary, said people felt more American after the war. They acted more like a nation, he said. The song that would become the country's national anthem, the Star-Spangled Banner, was written during the War of 1812. Madison benefited from most people's belief that the war was a success. The end of his second term began what historians call the era of good feelings. Madison left the presidency more popular than when he had started it. After he retired, Madison lived on his Virginia estate for nearly another 20 years. He died in his bed at age 85. A niece was in the room. She says that a strange look passed her uncle's face. She asked him what was wrong. Madison's last words were, Nothing more than a change of mind, my dear. I always talk better lying down. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.